Hey, Revelstoke Alliance Church, I'm glad you could join us. We are continuing on with our sermon series, All About Love. And these days, uh, with all of the wars and the really toxic interactions on social media, uh, the adversarial politics, the ever-increasing rates of divorce, it seems as if there's just not enough love in the world. So we're trying to trace how our culture, our society, ended up in the place that it has done. And after that, after we've traced that through some of the steps that our culture took along the way to get where we are, then we're going to compare those steps with what the Bible talks about love. In the first week, we looked at an ancient Greek book all about love called Plato's Symposium. And we saw in there that their understanding of love was very self-centered. If I like something, I pursue a relationship with someone else who has that something uh, to meet the need that I have. It's all about me. It's all about getting rather than giving. And then last week we looked at ancient Rome, which took the Greek culture of self-centered need and added a layer of power and domination on top of it. Love in ancient Rome was all about how high up the social ladder you are, and that gave you the right to use and misuse people below you in the social ladder. For example, uh, the citizens. If you were a citizen, which was about 10% of the Roman Empire, more or less, um, you could do anything you wanted to your slaves, which made up between like 20 and 30% of the empire. Slaves were regarded as property and not even regarded as people. And this was typified, as we saw last week, by Ovid's poetry called The Art of Love that uses military and hunting metaphors to describe how to enter into a relationship with another person. It's all about breaking down someone's defenses and uh, laying a trap for someone, reeling someone in, all those things. And we compared both of those views, the Greek view and the Roman view, with the Bible's views on love which is very much about commitment, serving, and giving rather than using, dominating, and taking. The Bible has the polar opposite views on love in comparison to ancient Greece and Rome. And today we're going to consider a slightly different aspect of love, and that is, what causes love to go wrong? What takes a relationship off course? As I said, our our world is filled with unloving acts and situations. It's filled with anger and hate and conflict. What's the source of all of that? And once we look at the source of what is poisoning love in our world, we can think about what the solution is to that poison. How can we heal an unloving world? And what part can I play in this as an individual? Something has gone wrong in our world, and what is it exactly, and how can it be fixed? So today's <coughs> pardon me, today's book that we're going to consider as a book called The Confessions by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau was a philosopher born in Geneva in the 1700s. His work really profoundly shaped many other thinkers and politicians who came after him. For, for example, the French Revolution was, was shaped a lot by Rousseau's thinking, as was Thomas Jefferson, the American Revolution, the Declaration of Independence, uh, and additionally, Uh, Rousseau's philosophy also affected Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto as well as Friedrich Nietzsche in modern-day psychotherapy. Rousseau's main idea was this, that all of humanity is born good and pure. It is society with all of its structures that corrupts humans. So the ideal, according to Rousseau, would be living free in the countryside, away from any cities, without any schools or universities, governments or churches telling us what to do. If we would be able to do that, if we could live an authentic life, be free to be truly me without the interference of anybody else, that's what the goal was as far as Rousseau uh, understood it. Now, I've heard something similar to that from so many younger people here in Revelstoke. Just give me some acreage out in the Kootenays, we'll all be good. <clears throat> if those thoughts resonate with you, just know that you got them from Rousseau about 300 years ago. Rousseau put it this way. He said, man is born free and everywhere he's in chains. One famous example in his book, 
that he was pressured by his boss, by a man named Verat, to steal a local woman's asparagus. Rousseau was pressured by his boss to steal this asparagus from her garden and then go sell it in the local market and bring the proceeds back to the boss. He didn't want to do it, but he went along with it. And so his boss became the corrupter of his soul. Rousseau had been born free, but society with all of its structure and pressures had put him in chains. Now, after he'd got used to stealing the asparagus, he went on a bit of a crime spree, stealing wherever and whenever he liked. He described the change within him this way. He said, A continual repetition of ill treatment rendered me callous. It seemed a kind of composition for my crimes, which authorized me to continue them. And instead of looking back at the punishment, I looked forward to revenge. Being beat like a slave, I judged I had a right to all the vices of one. The culprit, he says, was society, other people, his boss. And Russo was the victim. And the result was he was corrupted into becoming a thief without remorse. <clears throat> you may have heard uh, the use of the word recently, quite recently, systemic in the last few years. Systemic racism, systemic patriarchy, systemic poverty, systemic inequality. It means the system is broken. Society itself is corrupt. That's why we have become unloving and broken ourselves. That line of thinking is the problem doesn't lie with me. It lies within the systems around me. So we should break those systems down and live individually free and authentic lives. The problem, according to Rousseau, according to that line of thinking, the problem is external. The solution is internal. All of those kind of thoughts have their source in Rousseau. Now, Rousseau called his book The Confessions because around 1,300 years before he wrote his book, around the year 400 AD, there was another book written called The Confessions. That book was written by Augustine of Hippo, a Christian bishop in North Africa. He also wrote a book detailing his own life and he also drew some universal principles out of his own circumstances. But Augustine came to quite a different conclusion than Rousseau. And one of the most striking examples also involves Augustine stealing some fruit from a neighbor's garden. Instead of asparagus, though, Augustine stole some pears. He was hanging out with a group of his friends. They saw his, a neighbor's tree filled with pears, uh, and so they climbed it. They threw the pears down. They fed some to the local pigs. They ate a couple, took a few bites, and they tossed the rest away. And this is what Augustine had to say about all of that. He said, It was foul, and I loved it. I loved my own undoing. I loved my error. Not that for which I erred, but the error itself. A depraved soul falling away from security in thee to destruction in itself, seeking nothing from the shameful deed but shame itself. You see, Augustine didn't need the pears. He was not particularly hungry. And he didn't blame the other boys for pushing him into stealing them. He just got a thrill from doing something he was not supposed to do. <clears throat> I think maybe we've all done something destructive for just the sake of it as kids. Maybe we have lit something on fire or pushed something over. Or maybe graffitied something, stolen something. But why did we do it? If you ask a kid, why do you do something like that? The answer is, don't know. Because for the thrill of it. Now, Augustine, much later in his life, would encounter the Bible, particularly the book of Romans, and it would change his life. In that book, we read about something quite profound. We read in the book of Romans that all humanity, all humanity, is born sinful. We're all born with the internal capacity, with the internal propensity towards selfishness and even evil. If you think about Rousseau's proposition, just for a second, uh, again, that he said that humans are good, but it's just other humans and their collective society that are evil. If every human is inherently good, then when we all get together, shouldn't our societies also be good? If we are all inherently good, then governments would be only good. Schools, universities, sports teams, churches. 
If everyone in them is good, then they themselves would be only good. But they're not. They all have their challenges and shortcomings and problems. Why? Because they're all made up of humans. And humans, while they certainly do have the capacity for good, also they have the capacity for evil. Every single one of us. Augustine's description of the motivation for stealing the pears is truer than Rousseau's for stealing the asparagus. Which means if we were to distance ourselves from every other institution and cultural construct in society, we would still have problems because the propensity and capacity for evil run through the middle of our own hearts. In other words, the problem is not external, it's internal. It's in each and every one of us. The book of James in the Bible puts it this way. This is James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Russia and Ukraine. They desire, but they don't have, so they kill. Israel and Palestine. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Two siblings, both wanting to play with the same toy. That's an argument and a fight and usually ends in tears. So where does this selfishness, this lack of love come from? The Bible says they come from your desires that battle within you. So yes, I mean, Rousseau was partly right, sure. Society and culture and systems and government can be totally corrupt and sinful. But Augustine was also right. They are sinful because we as individuals are sinful. We as individuals have the capacity not only for love but also for hate. Or worse still, the capacity for indifference towards someone who needs love. So if the world needs more love, yet we as humans internally are the source of working against that love, then what is the solution? Well, remember that Rousseau said that the problems are external, but the solution is internal? Well, Jesus says the exact opposite. Our problems are in fact internal, and the solution, love, is external. Well, let me break it down a little bit. Jesus is discussing at this passage we're going to look at, Jesus is discussing with the Pharisees about whether eating with unwashed hands make, makes them ceremonially unclean, unclean, or forbidden from engaging with the temple rituals to approach God. That's what unclean means. They couldn't enter into the temple, couldn't approach God because they had eaten without washing their hands and therefore had broken a temple law and were unclean. So the Pharisees saw the problem as external. The pollution to the individual came from their unwashed hands. But Jesus said, Matthew chapter 15, verses 17 to 20, Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, immorality theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands doesn't defile them. So Jesus was saying internal pollution is the problem, sin. And we carry it around with us wherever we go. That's why the world knows how to redistribute food and wealth in a way that nobody need ever go hungry again, but we are not willing to do it. Why? Because we all want a little bit more than the other person. That's why communism collapsed in the Soviet Union. In theory, it should work. Everyone works for the good of society, and everyone gets exactly the same so that everyone's needs are met. And yet it was a complete and utter failure. Why? Well, the internal sin of each and every human. So if the problem is internal, then the solution has to be external. John 3.16, perhaps the most well-known verse in North America at least. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's read it again. For God so loved the world that he gave. 
he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God's sacrificial, generous, unmerited, liberal, open-handed, open-hearted, giving, lavish, free love is offered to each and every one of us. If we turn from our sin and ask God and ask for God's love to come into us, it will transform us from the inside out. Romans 5 verse 5 says, Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Not from our own efforts to be more loving and less selfish, but God pouring his love out. That's the solution to the problem of our sinfulness and our lack of love and our lack of peace in our lives. Not an acreage in the Kootenays away from all the hustle and bustle of society is nice as that may sound sometimes. Now going back to the book of James, James chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 says, You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask God, you don't receive because you ask with all the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So the solution to this problem, verse 7, same chapter, James 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and will. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. <coughs> so repent. Turn around. Repent of your sinfulness. Turn to God in humility. Ask God to fill you with his love. Live in that space. And then the fights, the quarrels, the selfishness will begin to fade away. And in its place, you're going to find love. Love for God and love for your fellow sinful human neighbor. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Amen. Join us next week.